All right. Uh, I think we're going to start. Um, we are very, very honored to have one of our own uh, former bank staff back in the bank today. Is no Sir Gildan. He's not just any one of us. Uh, is someone who distinguished himself in a number of ways. Worked with many of you. I've seen many of you come up and and greet him. Um, and a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for what he has done in the bank and outside. Uh, Ismail is somebody who's um, uh, had, had so far a very distinguished career, uh, a great thinker, uh, a very prolific author. Um, he's currently the director of the Library of Alexandria um, and chairs a number of academic and research advisory committees. Um, He's an Egyptian, and so I'm sure you'll have a few things to say about what's happening in, in Egypt today and more broadly, perhaps, in the region. Um, he, uh, he started his studies at Cairo University, completed them at Harvard. Uh, and in looking at his CV on the web, I, I think I've never seen that many degrees uh, listed together. Um, he has um, a public welfare medal from the uh, National Academy of Sciences. He headed the CGIR. Uh, and he was a vice president of ESSD, Environmentally and Socially Sustainable Development Network here in the bank. He taught at Collège de France. He taught at Wageningen. He taught at Harvard. Um, and he teaches us a little bit every day. Um, this is one of those times in the MENA region where I work where thinking long run, thinking what does it all mean, not getting caught in the moment is very valuable. And so um, uh, it is that kind of uh, view of the world um, and um, the role that the Library of Alexandra plays uh, in, 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 uh, in moments like this that Ismail is going to bring to us today. Um, I want to welcome you here today after this sort of disappointing snow day uh, yesterday. Uh, and we have a number of people joining us from country offices. Um, I will now pass on the, the word to Mohini. Uh, we're going to have a presentation, a small presentation from, uh, from Ismail. Uh, afterwards, we leave quite a bit of time for questions and answers. I will ask you to come to the microphones so that the quality of sound is better, so that people in the offices can hear us well. Thank you. Mohini. Okay. It's, it's really my pleasure, and it's our honor, Ismail, and thank you for your time here. So. Um, Ishmael Saragaldin has been invited by the Library of Congress, and we hijacked a little bit of his time to come and share with us, so thank you for that. Manuela talked about Ishmael and his incredible resume. Actually, if you Google Ishmael on, I'd like you to take a guess of how many hits you're going to find. I stopped counting at 734 yesterday, and there were 75 Google pages and continued. So just, I think, not much to say. What I'd like to do is say a little bit about Ishmael the human being and Ishmael as a leader. And I say this because my new role in the bank is running our leadership and staff development program. And there is a change. You know, we're all changing. Change is constant. And one of the ideas we're looking at is really how do you think about leadership traits, what are values, and what's our culture that binds us and binds us to our mission. And I can't think of a better person to introduce. So I'm going to speak about Ishmael. Really, a couple of points. And for all of you who know him, I think I speak for all of us. Um, we, my colleagues, and I'd like to say Joseb and Kara um, on our team who run language and culture, when they were pulling together what to say about Ishmael, they really picked his creed. Um, in terms of who he is, the world is my home, humanity is my family, nonviolence, peace, justice, equality, and dignity for all. And while we refresh our own values in this organization, I can't think of any of those that we wouldn't all stand behind, your personal values and the values that bring us together here. So thank you for your leadership on values. I'd like to talk about um, leadership of ideas. 
So a long time ago, and I'm looking at Iowa in the room, um, we worked in a different vice presidency, and Ishmar was vice president of environment sustainable development. So finance and financial services wasn't quite his job description. <laughs> but he met a Bangladeshi man named Muhammad Yunus on a flight and got really compelled by his ideas of how do you extend the reach of financial markets for the mass majority in the developing world. And he thought, this is a good space, and the bank should be involved. So he mobilized energy. He mobilized energy within the bank, and he kind of said, implement. So it was a time of leadership of ideas and of impact. It wasn't leadership of fiefdom or turf. Um, leadership of influence. Um, as Manuela was talking about um, Ishmael and the role he played and continues to play, he chairs CGIAR, he started CGAP, there's the water partnership. We could go on and on and on, but the idea was leadership of influence and you bring many people on the same page towards common cause and you just get more impact. So I think that's a key lesson that he's learned. And when I talk about leadership for influence, I don't know about you all, but at the end of a long mission, I usually read junk magazines and watch weird movies. But I remember coming back on long flights from intense missions with Ishmael. You look across the aisle and he's writing articles, and there are articles on protecting coral reefs for fashion, women's magazines in the Arab world, with Jacques Cousteau, why to get influence of ideas and public support around issues we should all care about that are not common front. So influence and partnership across, across many unlikely spheres. Um, leadership of intellectual curiosity. And again, I speak for when he started, when he met Mohammed Yunus, and he'd worked in lots of spaces, but the financial inclusion was kind of a new new sphere, and so he called and he said, so what do I need to read? I'm going on holiday. And I remember taking 25 books and delivering them and thinking, yeah, yeah, VPs, you know, they kind of gloss over lots of different ideas. But he came back a week later, he had written a paper, he sat the team down, and he had really critical, incisive, why this and why not that, contradiction of ideology, contradiction of practice. What's the, mo you know, so we had a huge debate. So deep intellectual curiosity, um, no hierarchy of ideas. Um, you were obliged to disagree, you were obliged to dissent, you were obliged to bring multiple points of view, and he respected and actually wanted you to disagree with most points of view. Um, leadership of dissent. And then I would just like to talk about just being a renaissance human being, because whereas all the topics that Manuela talked about, and many of us who have worked with Ishmael know about, you'd also sit outside his office waiting for a meeting and pick up something he'd written, and it's a critical assessment of Shakespeare with a foreword by Nobel laureate Sally Boyinkin, um, or books on architecture or religion, um, of, on values, on, on many different ideas. So I'll stop there by saying, um, for many of us who've worked with you, Thank you for freshness, optimism, hope, um, and a lot of traits that we're trying to reinstate in our organization that most of us would hope that we can pay forward. Welcome. Thank you for your time. And we all look forward to learning continuously. Thank you very much, Marini and uh, Manuela. I, I do make one correction, though, to what you said, and that this is going to be a very brief presentation. No, it's not. It's, uh, it's but I'm going to take you on such a roller coaster journey uh, with pictures and and uh, 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 our, my my uh, good friend, the beloved Roland, uh, uh, used to say, a "Presentation from Saragadin is like watching a movie with a voiceover." <laughs> Uh, so uh, you will see a lot because I need to, uh, I mean, put you and connect you with these amazing events that are going on in Egypt, and also why I decided to uh, leave the World Bank after 28 years, even though I was very happy here. Well, uh, it was for this project, the rebirth of the Library of Alexandria, and for those of you who haven't been there, this is the picture of the building. The building is uh, quite spectacular. It won many awards. But fundamentally, it's not the building. It's what happens in it that counts. And I'll tell you more about it because it's not really a library. So after 28 years, I left in 2000 to undertake the realization of an amazing dream. And I became the founding director of the Biblioteca Alexandrina or the BA. And we had exciting adventures and great success, but the question is, will we and the dream survive the current revolution in the Arab world? So that's where we are right now. And 
As she said, I'm an optimist, so the answer is yes. So let me run you through all these points. I have to tell you something about the ancient library, which was not a library, but was the greatest adventure of the human intellect in human history, and the evolving library of today, and what we do, and how I use the fact that we were born digital to take a, a leading position for the library, and the revolution, and where we are now, and maybe something about the future. So let me tell you a little bit about the ancient library. And those of you all, everybody here knows Egypt. It's really a very old country. My story will start uh, relatively recently with Alexander the Great, 2,300 years ago. Just to give you perspective, when Alexander arrived in Egypt, the time distance between Alexander and the pyramids is greater than the time distance between Alexander and us. That's how deep it runs in history. Now, Alexander was not just a conqueror, he was a student of Aristotle. Now, can you imagine being personally mentored by Aristotle? It's an amazing story. I mean, just, no wonder he came around. He decided, he picked the, the place for Alexandria, for the future capital of Alexandria, and moved on. And he did actually all of this. He was on horseback, but his soldiers were on foot. And they conquered this huge empire. And as a result, we had a new phenomenon. Because the Library of Alexandria was not going to be the first library. There were libraries in ancient Egypt. There were libraries in Greece. But whereas the ancient Egyptian ones were concerned with Egyptian knowledge and the Greeks were concerned with Greek knowledge, this would be the first library that was dedicated to universal knowledge, unifying everything of all humans. And uh, after his death, his empire was split up, and the Ptolemies took this empire of Egypt, and then Ptolemy the first Soter is the one who really built the uh, uh, city of Alexandria, built the library. And in fact, the story of the library is a story of many amazing women. We start with Berenike I, who was his queen, second wife, and to convince him that his successor should be her son, Ptolemy II, who would rule for 42 years and would give very special attention to the library project, which in turn was one of the two wonders of ancient Alexandria. So this is ancient Alexandria. My office right now, my library is right here. And this is where Alexander stood and said that he wanted to build on this port. He wanted to build the future Alexandria here. And this island of Pharos where the great lighthouse stood and was connected by a heptastidian causeway. Later on, it filled in on both sides, and we have this harbor that exists to this day. But all travelers talked of two marvels the lighthouse of the ancient city of Alexandria, and somewhere here, we don't know exactly where, the Great Library. This is the lighthouse, reconstructed in a good way. This is a reconstruction by Carl Sagan in Cosmos for what the ancient library could have looked like, because we don't have very accurate descriptions of it. We know there were columns, beams, and that there were stacks to put rolls of scrolls between them, that scholars came from all over the world. But the idea was really to allow people to come and study in all fields together without any pressure on what they would produce. Now, this is a celebratory coin, and I will show you this capital. Take a good look at it. You'll see it in a moment. Uh, this guy, Demetrius of Phaleron, who used to run Athens as a tyrant. Tyrant was a title. Remember, Archimedes worked for the tyrant of Syracuse, so he was tyrant of Athens. And he had been bounced after 10 years, and he came as between jobs, so he became advisor to, to Ptolemy. And he told him this amazing story, idea. He said, if you want Alexandria to be the greatest city in the world, temples and marbles and gold is all fine, but get the greatest minds in the world and bring them here and then give them nothing to do. Now, this is a very brilliant idea, actually. It's what the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton does. It's what all the great universities now do with university professorships. Very distinguished professors, they don't have any obligations. They can teach if they want. They can do research if they want. They can do whatever they want. But it's good to have them on campus, right? So he brought them all together. And sure enough, it was part academy and uh, part university and part library and uh, 
part uh, research institute. It had attached to it a botanical garden. So it was a temple to the muses, and they called the museon, in Greek museum in Latin. Museum has a different connotation now, but at the time it was a temple to the muses, to which they added a botanical garden, a zoological garden, a dissection room, which is very rare in those days, and a library. And the library grew and grew and grew and grew until the name of the library took over for the whole complex. And this is Ptolemy II, the son of Bereniki, who for 42 years, as absolute ruler of then the richest country in the world, uh, gave support to the library. They had scrolls, not volumes as we know them, but they had about 700,000 scrolls, which is the largest penetration of known knowledge in the world at the time. Maybe the internet will do differently now. They taught girl students, 200 BC, and uh, in fact, uh, Cleopatra was uh, uh, learned there, and the great Hypatia, whom I will talk about in a moment. So this is what we wanted to recreate. The idea of going back, it all disappeared, and I'll tell you in a moment how it disappeared. But at the very least, the, the, there was, this is the Pharos, and this was the Museon, and then there was a next building by the harbor on which they put a lot of books. And then the library had a third building, which was called the Daughter Library, in what was known as the Serapium, or the Temple to Serapis. And uh, the Ptolemies, this is the foundation stone of the Serapium, would write in two languages always, or more, and we're very happy for that, because that's in Greek and in hieroglyphics, because we wouldn't have had the Rosetta Stone, which comes from Ptolemy V, and uh, which is in Greek and demotic and uh, uh, hieroglyphics, and which, of course, enabled the decipherment of hieroglyphics. Now, the god Serapis, who figures in our story, is the only god I know who was created by committee. <laughs> and uh, they really, no, I'm, I'm serious. They, they said, we want a god that will be acceptable to the Greeks and to the Egyptians who were composing that city. And uh, as such, uh, they got together and they put bits and pieces of uh, Zeus and Dionysus, and mind you, Dionysus, because uh, bon vivant in, uh, in the Mediterranean, <laughs> bon vivant, so, <laughs> so they had Dionysus and Zeus and uh, uh, Osiris and Apis. And for 700 years, he would be the, the god of Alexandria. So his temple was here, and the daughter library was added in that temple. And so it goes on from marble to marble until we reach Cleopatra, and that's the beginning of the end for us. Now, uh, you know, it had all fields, including poets. Kalimakos, the greatest poet of the, of the Hellenistic period, was told by my predecessor, director, the third director, Eratosthenes, that he could do poetry on his own time if he wanted to, but do something useful. And he asked him to write a catalog of the ancient library. And that was the first time ever that universal knowledge was organized by subject, by author within subject, and then alphabetically by author. And that's how we still do it today. So Kalimachos became the founder of, if not library science, then at least bibliographies. However, his work, the Pinakes, which is in 120 volumes, well, we call them volumes, but they're scrolls, really, 120 scrolls, uh, really was extremely important because that's how we know what we lost. So uh, when we say, because the Pinakes was copied many, many times, and so when we say that Euripides wrote 106 plays but only eight survive, how do we know that? We know that because he listed them all. And it's like saying there was this guy, Shakespeare, and we have these two plays, but we understand that he wrote something called Hamlet and something called Macbeth and something called... <laughs> and we have no more record of what these were. So through the Pinakis, we know that. Aristarchus was the first human being to say that the sun uh, is fixed and the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. We don't have his work, but we have the work of his contemporaries who disagreed with him. The duty of dissent in the ancient library. And uh, yeah, they say, I disagree with what Aristarchus has been saying, his heliocentric theory and so on. And that was a, a full 1800 years before Copernicus. Eratosthenes proved that the earth was spherical and calculated the circumference of the earth with great accuracy 
at a time when later on people were still concerned about sailing over the edge of the world. Hipparchus calculated the length of the solar year to within six and a half minutes. And when you consider six and a half minutes, the 365 day and the quarter, when you consider the instruments that they had, and, and to get the circumference of the Earth right to within 98.25 accuracy. Uh, these are remarkable scientific feats, which people at the Academy of Science are still in awe of. And if you go into the hall of the Academy of Science here in Washington, D.C., you will see they have four medallions for the precursor institutions of knowledge, the first of which is the ancient library of Alexandria. So it wasn't just a library. It was really something very different. They established the calendar, the 365 and a quarter days and leap years, which Julius Caesar was so enamored with when he went there that he imposed it on the Roman Empire in 44 to 45 BC and became known as the Julian calendar. Our greatest uh, employee in the ancient library was Euclid. And Euclidean geometry um, would have been produced as a work for hire as a, by an employee, copyright would have belonged to the library, right? It's been the most cited work in history, I think. <laughs> I don't know how many editions of, of Euclid. We've all learned geometry in the classroom by him and his elements of geometry. Archimedes came as a visiting scholar for two and a half years in which he worked on the hydrostatics and levers. And en passant, invented the Archimedean screw which you can see is still being used 2,300 years later uh, in the Delta in Egypt to raise the water of the Nile for irrigation. It's called the tambour there. Uh, uh, Herophilus identified different parts of the body. Uh, he did a new school of medicine. Maneto organized the history of Egypt. And when we say the pharaoh such and such in the 18th dynasty or the 23rd dynasty, these are the classifications of Maneto from the ancient library of Alexandria. So you can see this explosion of knowledge that occurred. They were open to all the cultures. The first translation ever of the ancient testament, the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek was done in the ancient library of Alexandria, the Septuagint as it's called. And early on, when St. Mark brought Christianity to Africa through Alexandria in 50 AD, the early fathers of the church, such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen later on, uh, would work at trying to do what would be done much later, which was how to combine philosophy with theology at the time. And girl education continued throughout all of this from beginning to end. Famous girls were there. So little remains physically, but it lives on uh, in the minds of people. When was it destroyed? Well, contrary to popular myth, the Arabs had nothing to do with it. It disappeared centuries before. It disappeared in stages. And remember, there were three stages at least, the ancient library here, and um, by the, 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 uh, next to the, to the wharf, and in the Serapium. Well, Julius Caesar arrives in 48 BC. These stories really defy the imagination, but they're real. This part is real. Cleopatra has herself rolled in a carpet and smuggled into his camp, and he unrolls the carpet, and there she is, a young princess of 18 years old, who was not particularly beautiful. And this is where I have to destroy the image of Shakespeare and Hollywood. Uh, she was incredibly intelligent, incredibly well-educated. She spoke five languages. She wrote poetry. She did arithmetic, which for a young princess in her time, just enormous erudition. And uh, she had a lot of personality. Uh, and that's what really attracted Caesar and Antony to her. And you have to remember, these guys were masters of the world. They, if it was uh, just uh, uh, physical sexuality, they had at their beck and call all the slave girls of the world. So the fact that they were so taken by her was really her personality, not her appearance. And uh, so she convinced him to stand by her against her brother, and he did. And they burnt the both fleets, the Egyptian and the Roman fleet, in the harbor, and unintentionally, that big fire the warehouse caught fire here. And depending on who you read, 40,000 scrolls were destroyed, 200,000, 400,000, who knows, were destroyed. When that was the first fire of the ancient library of Alexandria, 48 BC. Now, after that, however, Caesar is killed. We know his story with Cleopatra. They have a boy, and she goes with him to Rome. And then the death of Caesar, well-known, and out comes Mark Antony, 
saying, you know, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, <laughs> not, uh, not all that story. Well, Antony himself, of course, gets enormously enamored with Cleopatra. Now, that is Antony Hollywood version, and that is Antony real. This is Cleopatra Hollywood version, and this is Cleopatra real. <laughs> so, uh, the, he falls madly in love with her. Now, here's my defense of Cleopatra. What does he do to get into her good graces? What gift does he give her? Not jewelry, not gold. Not, I mean, again, he was ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. He gives her the 200,000 books in the library of Pergamon. Now, you ask yourself, what kind of woman is it? The way to her heart is a massive book donation to the National Library. And I say, my kind of woman. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I have to make a defense of Cleopatra, whatever. He gave her the 200,000 scrolls because Pergamon was part of the Roman Empire, and the emperor said simply, move these to Alexandria, and we know that they arrived. So what happened, the library continued after that, but they had a really great love story that people write about till now. The Battle of Actium, of course, was the beginning of the end, and Octavian and uh, Others ended in defeating them, and then Cleopatra and Antony both committed suicide, and uh, uh, it was Octavian who becomes then the first truly Roman emperor and under the name of Augustus and establishes the Pax Romana, the Roman Empire. And Egypt then becomes nearly a part of the Roman Empire. And at that time, he still appoints somebody at the library, and he still spends money on the library, but it's no longer as important as it was, although it will continue to the point where even the great Galen, the greatest Roman physician, medical man, uh, although he studied in Pergamon, uh, and he was a personal uh, physician of two emperors, Marcus Aurelius and, and Commodus, he had to come and do like a postdoc in Alexandria for a year because it was still a good thing to do. And he continues uh, until St. Mark arrives, and St. Mark brings Christianity, and the Romans persecute the Christians in Egypt in a terrible, terrible, terrible way, to the point where the calendar of Egyptian Christians still starts with the year of the martyrs, 273 AD. So, uh, Around 272, I'm sorry, 293, 272, uh, uh, there's another amazing lady, Queen Zenobia, and she comes from Syria, in what is known as Palmyra, uh, or Tadmor in Arabic, and uh, she conquers uh, Egypt and part of Egypt and Alexandria, and the Alexandrians welcome her as a savior from the persecution that they've been encountering. Well. That does not sit well with the Roman Emperor, Emperor Aurelian, who comes, this is Palmyra in Syria right now, and uh, uh, who comes in 272 and puts order in Alexandria. Now, I don't have to tell you what Roman emperors did when they came upon a rebellious province, what they did to it, but it was absolutely terrible. But what is most important is that he destroyed the entire royal quarter to the point where, according to the Chronicles, there is not a stone left on top of the other. And all that's left, not only then the library itself disappears, but in fact the entire royal district here is completely destroyed. And that gives us, for those of you who come and visit and have an inclination to be the Indiana Joneses of our current time, I have the biggest question in archaeology. The biggest question in archaeology where is the tomb of Alexander the Great? It was supposed to be somewhere here, at the Solomon here. We know because we know also that uh, Caesar and Augustus both went, you know, to stand by the tomb of Alexander. We know it was there. But it was totally destroyed along with the whole royal quarter. And if you ask people today, they'll say, oh, you know, it's right in the basement of this building. If you destroy this big building here, you'll find it. No, 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 not that building. You destroy this building here, and this you'll find it. So I say to people, when you go into the catacombs of Alexandria, maybe you'll knock a wall and discover something, and who knows? 
the, the, the tomb of Alexander the Great still awaits discovery. <laughs> so, what happens then? What was left was left around the temple of Serapis, and then uh, a strange edict came from Rome in 391 AD. Now, strange because we all associate Constantine the Great with uh, the adoption of Christianity in the Roman Empire. And he himself converted, and he moved the capital to Constantinople, as you know. But he did not ban other religions. It was 70 years later that Emperor Theodosius issued a decree banning all religions other than Christianity. And then Patriarch Theophilus in Alexandria went and destroyed the Serapium, the temple to the god Serapis, that god that had been created by committee, and where the daughter lied remained, and he burnt it down. And this manuscript shows him standing on top of the burning uh, Serapium, and it's in Vienna, this manuscript. Now, what remained was some personal documents in the hands of the scholars for an uneasy coexistence for another generation. And Hypatia, daughter of Theon, was the first woman, actually, whose name appears in the Chronicles of Astronomy and, uh, and uh, Mathematics, uh, uh, was a Neoplatonist philosopher and was very beautiful, a very famous orator, uh, but uh, she was killed by the mob in the most atrocious way. They cut her to pieces and scraped the flesh from the bone and lit fire to the remains. It's a terrible, terrible uh, story. And at the end of that, of course, that's the end the full stop on the history of the ancient library. It's 415 AD, a full 226 years before the arrival of the, of the Muslim. And that part, uh, which is a generation after the destruction of the Serapium, was collapsed together in this movie. If you haven't seen the movie, it's quite good, Agora, about Hypatia. Mm -hmm. And Hypatia is a remarkable woman in many, many ways. And uh, this is the reconstruction of... Uh, of uh, that would be the last person to hold the title that I now have, as I say to people. I've sort of we've now reopened for business after a brief hiatus of 1600 years. Uh, and uh, I'm the first to hold that title now in all this time, director of the Library of Alexandria, librarian of Alexandria. So she was the daughter of Theon. And uh, she's a very real historical person. And the scientists in her honor named the crater on the moon. Uh, in her honor, so as the first woman whose name appears in the scrolls of mathematics and astronomy. Her own work hasn't survived, but we know we have letters of people asking her how to calculate and construct astrolabs, which is very, very complicated. So anyway, that means that if you look at that, the destruction of the library wasn't in one. It was a long period, almost 400 and some years in which bit by bit it was disappearing until it disappeared. The remaining schools then were completely under the thumb of the church. There was no independent inquiry, no debates, no thinking as there existed before. And that's not surprising because that was the beginning of the Dark Ages in Europe as well. I mean, it was 500 AD is about roughly, we say, from the fall of Rome to the fall of Constantinople, from the 5th century to the 15th century, uh, the thousand years of the Dark Ages, well, they were starting everywhere. So the old library for six centuries was really a center of world learning. The best in the world came there. It gave us the name museum. It gave us also, for the World Bank, I have to say this, the two oldest recorded complaints I could find. One on funding research. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Timon of Flewes writes, surely the kings of Egypt have a better uses for their money than to bring the, a bunch of bookworms and scribblers to sit and gab in the chicken coop of the muses. That was his view. <laughs> Do something useful with your money, like building a temple. <laughs> the other one is really cute, because there's a, in the early uh, uh, first century BC, there's a complaint to the governor of Alexandria. Uh, saying uh, the king brings these foreigners uh, for their presumed knowledge and gives them huge uh, salaries on which they pay no taxes. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> See, guys, 2,000 years ago, <laughs> people were already complaining about, about that. So that existed. Anyway. So what's left today? Well, 
uh, fragments of the past. This is where the Serapium used to be, and you can still visit in the catacombs there. The uh, forum. This fort was built with the with the rubble of the ancient uh, pharos, but in the water we have discovered uh, underwater archaeology, the remnants of the ancient library, ancient everything actually, including this column. Now, doesn't that look like the one that was on the coin? Ah, it could be the same. Who knows? But we do know this. We retrieved the statue of Ptolemy I out of the water, and I said to people, bring him home. And there he stands now at the entrance of the new library. So Ptolemy has come back to stay with us and relink with the past. However, when I had turned down a lot of jobs to offers to become minister in Egypt and so on at the time, and people said, why would you leave the World Bank? I said, this is something else. This is not to be Minister of Economy or Finance or of Planning. This is to revive the dream of the ancient library of Alexandria in contemporary terms. And uh, as you saw, it's not just a library. So we have to recapture the spirit of the old in the terms of the new. But at a time when Egypt, far from being the richest country in the world, is now one of the poorest, so where do we go? Well, first of all, is that we need to change our outlook to libraries. The great libraries are seen as repositories of books, and they are fabulous, and I'm a great bibliophile myself, with vast reading rooms, and, and knowledge was parsed in individual volumes, and the books uh, can be very valuable in their own content, uh, as, uh, but as objects also, first editions and rare books and so on, and they are beautiful, beautiful books. But the modern version of library still retained for most people these shelves and so on, although we gradually started seeing the carols and the computers coming in, and the old card catalogs seeded the way to new catalogs and search engines, and even pictures and everything was be feasible. And these were the students as they work today, but many of us still hope that our books will be useful, at least for one generation. Those of you who came to, uh, to uh, the Library of Congress last December and, and heard me speak there would know that uh, I told people that the, the, the book as we know it, the book as a codex, because the, you know, a, a, a number of, of pages bound on one side we call the spine with a slightly heavier cover compared to scrolls. Uh, a codex came only in the 4th to 5th century AD. And uh, since then, uh, we've been using it. And now the problem, people, older people, look at young people and say, how can he read that way? And I say, in the fifth century, they probably were looking with scrolls and saying, how can he read in a codex? And we all read in codexes, right? Nobody cares that Homer and Euripides and, uh, and the Euclid and so on were written on scrolls and read on scrolls for centuries. We read them the way they are. So the fact that the book like that will disappear, the codex will disappear into new electronic formats and so on, is just the format. But the idea of a book as a collection of words with a certain length will survive. And we already have the bookless library. And uh, this is the engineering school at the University of Texas, who in uh, 2010 announced that uh, they were abolishing all books. And everything would be digital. And they've gone digital at that time. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm on the visiting committee for MIT's libraries that just came from there. And MIT current purchases of new additions to its library is 91% digital. 91% digital. So everything is turning there. But more profound issues are ahead, which I won't go into now. Uh, that's for another discussion. The question was, faced with that legacy, how do you rebuild this in a developing country like Egypt? So the new library of Alexandria, yes, it's a landmark building, but it has a hive of activities, many activities, multiple institutions, libraries, museums, art galleries, research institutes, etc. And uh, in the eight short years, we went from 50 staff to 2,400 staff, so it's a, a big employee. So that's the building itself. This is the new library of Alexandria. This was an existing conference center. That's a planetarium. And uh, it's all connected underground. But what you will notice here, there's no walls and gates anywhere. And that's important for the revolutionary part that comes. This is the campus of the university campus here. And on these two streets, 
This is where most of the demonstrations came. The building itself is beautiful. It was done by very young people. I have a lot of confidence in young people always. And this particular granite wall, uh, which has letters of all the alphabets of the world, but no complete words, was designed by a 26-year-old Norwegian sculptress. That's the library. It has won many awards. And these are just pictures of the library. That's the plaza, which, as you can see, has no gates or doors. And this is going down into the planetarium. So it's a very beautiful building. And it stands by the sea. If you were to lift the cover, you would see it's divided like that. This is the library part. And here we have research institutes and uh, administration. And it's connected underground to all of the others in a big complex. That's our reading room. And it's spectacular architecture throughout. The conference center. We have a, a big auditorium, 1,700 seats, and that's the plaza. And this statue, of course, was a gift. Everything is a gift because I, I have no money. So, But this statue was a gift from Greece, and it's a modern rendition of Prometheus bringing fire to humanity, which I thought was very appropriate to put in the plaza. There it is, and there's the sculptor of it. Now, it's a hive of activities. It's much more than a building. I did that on the fifth anniversary, anniversary and these are the pictures of the staff. Uh, it has a library, yes. It can take four to eight million books. Center for the Internet Archive. So when people said, how are you going to buy all the books like the ancient library? I said, I won't have to. I have a copy of the Internet Archive. And that's the modern equivalent of everything that humanity produces. Uh, conference center for thousands, planetarium, museums, etc. We receive about 1.4 million visitors. Of course, after the evolution, we dropped a bit. This year, I expect to be back close to a million. And then we'll be making up again. But we were receiving about 1.4 million annually. With lots of outreach for children. I remember all those girls that were studying in the ancient library. We want all those girls also <laughs> to get busy and uh, sometimes give talks to the children. Our websites, uh, are actually, that figure is changed. I should have updated that figure. It's now over 1.2 billion hits a year. We get 3.3 million hits a day on our website. And 600,000 reader visits. And 700 events like conferences, lectures, etc. Not counting the educational course meetings for the, especially for the art schools where we teach children uh, art, uh, something that has now been regretfully abolished from the official school programs. We have concerts, we organize concerts, we organize our own, uh, the first ever uh, uh, classical orchestra in Alexandria. We hold also all sorts of concerts, including rock concerts outside as well, classical concerts, and uh, choirs, ballet, etc. Uh, all sorts of events at the library. There you can see how many things we have, and international gatherings, and the annual book fair. And we have multiple institutions, it's very lively institutions. Uh, we are the, the secretariat for many of these institutions, uh, TWAS, the IFLA Arab Office, UNESCO Commissions of Egypt, uh, the ASSES, etc. We have a commitment to the arts and to the sciences. And as for the libraries, we have a hybrid library. So the main reading room, you will notice, has computers everywhere. And we have specialized libraries that are quite advanced. The Tahsin Library for the Visually Impaired, a children's library, 5 to 11 and young people 11 to 16, and then the multimedia library with art and audiovisuals, rare books library, and microforms library, map library, and the Internet Archive. That's Brewster Kale, the inventor of the Internet Archive, whom I convinced that the place for it is the Library of Alexandria. So we have actually the complete Internet Archives from, 2000, uh, from 1996 to 2007. After that, it became too big. It's growing too big, so we specialized, and we're looking at the Arabic part, and he's maintaining the other parts. So what you have there is really uh, quite stunning, because you have a, uh, uh, you know, what did George Bush, the candidate, say in 2000 at the time of the contested vote in Florida? Well, his website is no longer available but it's in the archives. You can go back and find it. And this is the Internet Archive. And just to give you an idea, you'll see just how big it is in a moment. Then uh, I convinced my friends in France to give us a book donation. 
the biggest book donation in history. They gave us 500,000 books. And that made us the fourth largest Francophone library outside of France, after uh, Geneva, Laval, and the New York Public Library, and the Library of Alexandria. Because we had 40,000 volumes, so now we have 540,000 volumes. And I told him that this was the biggest book gift since Anthony gave Cleopatra the 200,000. And he said, yeah, well, I hope I don't end up like Anthony. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. What's wrong with ending up like Anthony? I mean, Anthony ruled half the world, right? Uh, he had a fabulous love affair with Cleopatra, one of the most remarkable women in history. We're still talking about him 2,000 years after his death. Hollywood gets the young Marlon Brando to represent him. And who's going to talk about you and what, who will represent you in Hollywood? <laughs> To which he said, you know what, except for that last part, being Anthony isn't that bad. <laughs> I said, yeah. Anyway, that, that put our ranking way up there, as you saw, in the global libraries. And therefore, that's how I make do without any money, because I, you have to get gifts from different people. From the friends of the United States, different chapters, one just gave us 22,000 volumes as well. Boutrous Boutrous Ghali gave us a complete royal edition of the Description de l'Egypte and rare books of that kind. We have 19 museums and, and permanent galleries. The four museums are Sadat uh, and manuscripts and antiquities, which are gifts from all the Egyptian museums for all periods. And uh, this is the Islamic part, this is the Pharaonic part. Uh, science, History of Science Museum, which we designed with our friends from France in the Knan. This is the didactic part to show children the future, linked to the planetarium and an, an exploratorium where they can have hands-on exposure to science and encourage people to constantly ask what if, what if, what if. We have a special outreach to youth. And we've been doing that for a number of years. This was for an eclipse program. We have an annual BA science festival where we got 20,000 visitors. And these are the children. And to me, this picture is most important because the kids are having fun. And that's what counts. Science should not be, uh, well, let me remember Boyle's Law. and <laughs> well, no, It should be enjoyable. And they're enjoying That's what counts. And this will be. We have 15 permanent exhibitions and galleries like these everywhere. So these are all donated by the artists in question. This is the best uh, uh, ceramist in Egypt. This is a great sculptor, Adam Helin. It's another great sculptor, Abdel Wahab. And all their works are donated to the library. This is a folkloric art collection, and so on and so forth. We have 10 more of these. We have four galleries for temporary exhibitions that we change all the time. And when we have 10 research institutes, an institute with manuscripts, and uh, uh, an institute that deals with writing, the history of writing, we have special studies that's a virtual center that links researchers in Egypt with others outside. We organize a biannual biovision conference, once in Lyon, once in Alexandria. And uh, it produces uh, our work that comes from these conferences, it includes Nobel laureates every year who participate in that. Documentation, we have a center in Cairo that deals with documentation of heritage that also patented the first Kalcharama, patented to show that we were the first to do it. And it's patented in Europe also, not, not just, I mean, it's not commercial, but it really does the purpose of it. And we're doing it in 3D next. And we have a very, very advanced informatics program, which... Uh, uh, has helped us be at the leading position in the world. For example, uh, we participate, and you'll see in a moment, in the World Digital Library, 100 libraries from 70 countries initiated by the Library of Congress, and they elect us as the president of that effort for the next five years. Smallest, youngest of all those who, institutions, British Library, French Library, Chinese, the Brazilian, etc., Library of Congress, all there. We curated this and so on. An art center, our own orchestra I mentioned, and organizing a center for the study of Alexandria and the Mediterranean, not just the old city, but the new city as well. Hellenistic studies, that's to encourage masters and PhD programs for the study of that period of Egyptian history, which has been really a stepchild, because they teach it as Greco-Roman. And so there's ancient Egyptian, there's Coptic, and there's uh, uh, Islamic Egypt. And wait a minute, Hellenistic? 
Alexandria was the center of the world for six centuries. How come we don't study that enough? So uh, we are encouraging a center like that, a center for democracy and, and peace studies, social peace, which issued the, the first declaration called the Alexandria Declaration in 2004, and a center for development studies to mobilize Egypt's intellectuals. Mm -hmm. We hold events, we produce publications, etc. But the library itself was born digital, and I am committed to the notion of access to all information for all people at all times. And that, of course, puts me in direct confrontation with many of the publishers and many of the copyright issue people who are trying to defend uh, old models, old business models against new technologies. And I'm saying we have to find ways that meet the requirements of the authors, the requirements of the publishers, but that allow a lot of people to uh, get involved. And it's going to happen. So we need to link up and cooperate with others and add to the available material. And today it is true. We have the technology to put all the knowledge of the world at the fingertips of everybody. And this global knowledge system, we add to it. We did almost 200,000 books in Arabic now, all online and searchable. And we try to honor the past and celebrate the present and embrace the future. So honoring the past starts with manuscripts and we give anybody who wants a manuscript, we give him a CD of the man. We have 6,600 manuscripts of our own, so we can do that. And they can take it and study it with them. Uh, that's the center I mentioned. And they start with an archaeological map of Egypt. And you can search it here. And then when you find the location, you get, for example, and you want to look at this, and you find this particular tomb, you can navigate the tomb and get to see what's on the wall there. And then you can actually get a, an English translation of that at the bottom here, as you can see. And the, the, we did this with IBM, and the IBM people said, how long to finish all of Egypt? And Professor Saleh, Fathi Saleh, said, well, about 150 years. A lot to do. Well, architectural heritage of Cairo is done the same way. The monuments, individual buildings, streets, or architects. The wildlife, the wildlife, Maria, unfortunately, we also recorded the intangible heritage, music, and photographic memory, old photographs, documentation of folklore, and this nine screen computer. And in fact, you can visit eternalegypt.org if you want to see all of that in three languages. Alex Med has done recreations that were done of that. And let me just move on. It's, uh, and uh, working with uh, others, this is the mapping of the underwater pieces that are found. And this is uh, the recreation of the, well, that's the, the fort that was used with the rubble. The history of modern Egypt, we have created something that looks very close to the World Digital Library. It later on became part of the World Digital Library. We have the Description de l'Egypte, which is available. We digitized and made it available to search. We have archives. We created the archives of Nasser. Uh, audio-visual as well as text material, the archives of Sadat and Butos Butos Gali archives and others as well. And the Suez Canal, we have 2.5 million documents that we got from France with digitized, all the history of the magazine Al-Hilal, etc. And we celebrate the presence with the book collection. This is our digital lab with <coughs> maps, etc. And we created something called the, the Super Course, 170,000 PowerPoint lectures for free any teacher anywhere, and we have more than a million uh, uh, students now using it, uh, they, the idea is the local teacher takes whatever they want, either a complete lecture or compose their own, and use it, and you can get all of that for free. And all our events are webcast. And we embrace the future by moving for reform and defending the values of society, which we think is important. And we uh, uh, try to stand for freedom of expression, and that's a difficult thing in our part of the world. But I was very proud of the fact that our friends from Norway recognized our work and called it the beacon for freedom of expression dedicated to the new Library of Alexandria. It's a Norwegian program. And uh, we created this uh, home plate to link NGOs in Egypt. There are 1,800 on it. And the cause of children, we worked with uh, Ma'alapat in France, with the Academy of France, open source system, and we do science outreach. We decided our own TV studio. We created our own TV science program. 
plus enormous analytical work is presented at the library. We don't have a lab for bioinformatics, biorobotics, but they came to present it there. This cute little guy called Nao there is very popular, very popular. <laughs> Uh, we have a virtual reality uh, analysis uh, cave. We have our own supercomputer. Now, incidentally, to qualify as a supercomputer, you need to do more than 10,000 billion calculations per second. Otherwise, it's just a big computer. So uh, the digital future is here, and we are committed to that. Outreach, we have had outreach to universities, and we take this book mobile to children in the schools. We have art programs for children everywhere. And we have massive expansion of our science fair and science clubs, and we do uh, science competitions. And we decided, you know, our own TV studio and uh, science program. And, of course, the values. Values require debate and reform. And the Arab Youth Forum, the last one we did was in 2010, just before the revolution, with 600 delegates from all over the Arab world. And all the parts, I think, are essential, and they reinforce each other, and the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And that allows me to quote a great statement by Borges, who I agree with. And he said, I imagine paradise is some form of library. <laughs> I think it's true. So against that background comes the revolution. Now, at certain moments in history, you suddenly get a revolutionary moment. In, in 1848, throughout Europe, explosions of revolutionary fervor everywhere. 1968 was another one, United States, in Paris, in London, in Egypt, everywhere. 1989, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and Eastern Europe and all, is another one of those great moments, Russia in 91, and the Arab Spring. And it's all over the Arab world. It's an unstoppable wave when it comes. And these are just a reminder. This is the Tahrir Square. And that's during the revolution. That's normal Tahrir Square, and that's during the revolution. And it's at night, and uh, during prayer time, and totally fearless uh, against the attacks. Masha, this was a very symbolic battle, which is referred to as the Battle of the Camel. The, the ancien regime sent in people on horseback and camels with uh, swords and, and, uh, and sticks against uh, kids with uh, cell phones and iPads. And I said, oh my God, you couldn't draw a more polarized cartoonish image <laughs> of the future and the past confronting each other, the future one. And there the number one demand was that uh, both Mubarak and Gaman Mubarak would leave. And it's been closely followed by the rest of the world and it inspired the rest of the world. I was struck by what happened in Wisconsin. Look at that. Egypt help us. <laughs> Egypt supports Wisconsin. <laughs> so that was quite a, an inspiring moment. But what about the revolution? Well, I mentioned this is the campus, and these two streets are where the, the, uh, the demonstrations came. And remember, there's no doors, no gates, no nothing. And I was standing here with a few friends when I saw coming down this spike, down this a huge demonstration. Now people think of Cairo as the huge demonstration. This is Alexandria. <laughs> And suddenly, there I was standing wondering how I'm going to cope with these guys when they come closer. Out of the crowd, they broke out. They're revolutionaries themselves. They're carrying signs against Mubarak. And they held hands and said, this is the library. Nobody touches the library. And they protected it with this human chain. And everybody obeyed. See, And they had no weapons. This was purely a peaceful demonstration. You see, they hold uh, rolls of um, posters and stuff. And demonstration is over here that I just showed you. And uh, everybody obeyed. They didn't break the line. And prayer time came, and there's the library. And see, they're very orderly. Nobody did anything to the library. Ten blocks away, government house was burned to the ground. 
So it was not obvious <laughs> that they would uh, do that. And uh, so was the party headquarters, so was the police headquarters, which were protected. The library was not protected. And then they created a huge flag, and they wrapped the library in the flag. Here's the flag, and here's what they did with the flag. And that uh, allowed a lot of people to come, and there's, there I am with some of the children, and standing behind the flag and waving as the demonstrations were going by. This is on the other side, between the university and the library. Again, you will note there's no... The, the university has gates and, and walls, but we don't. I didn't put them here. But you will notice here, you can see them there also holding hands here to create this human chain, which is being obeyed by the demonstrators. And the big demonstrations, <laughs> I mean, they could very easily wreck the place, very easily. And then these steps became like a favorite place for human rights demonstrations. Uh, Christians concerned about some acts that occurred against uh, the Christian minority in Egypt and efforts to say, no, we are all together. Uh, the crescent and the, the cross, this is the cross, all standing in front of the library. And as you can see in these symbols. And to me, uh, we in the World Bank spent a lot of money doing evaluation of projects and figuring out whether they worked or not. This was the greatest evaluation I've ever had. I think it was an exalting moment, a moving moment when that happens. And it was wonderful, really. And this was even more wonderful. Now, this is a, a wall painted by the young people, graffiti. I don't know. I mean, I don't know who these people are who's holding hands. I don't know who painted this. But it says here, this is for the youth of the 25th of January, dedicated to those who died in the revolution. And uh, this is near Montezza, somewhere further to the east on, in Alexandria's Corniche. Here are the three pyramids. The fourth pyramid is the library. And coming out of it is a church and a mosque together. I mean, I think the kids really got it right. They got it all. And uh, two American authors actually wrote a book about it for children. And that's the book called Hands Around the Library. And it was a very moving experience. And uh, that and is... now your staff coming back to work. Yes. Lee Robertson did a special piece. Yes. 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 order back again? Uh, yeah, I hope so. I will speak to them, of course, like everybody else. There are yeah, citizens, there are different points of views. There are rumors around that I will speak to them about. See, even our coffee shop is starting to operate here. More than 2,000 workers. Everyone happy to be back. There must have been a moment when you were standing there. There was the, the, the moment for you where you think, no, this could happen and they could come in. And then you saw it change. Our confidence is there from, from the first day. We never built barriers. We never built walls. We never built gates that could be locked. The library is open. The doors of the library are in glass. As you saw on both sides, the, there's nothing that prevents anybody from destroying this building with all its treasures except the will of the people. And in the end, that is the ultimate guarantor of everything. And that appeared in, in various parts of the world. And that's, I had written a very special thank you to the marvelous youth of Egypt on our website uh, at the time it went by. But no institution was immune. The library, the, the Egypt uh, then went through another wave. Different currents became all over the place. There were hooligans and, uh, and the destructive people everywhere. They burned down the Academy of Science on the 17th of December 2011. And no institution was immune. And even in the library, uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, this is the books and manuscripts. Trying to save the books and manuscripts Destroy from the, beyond the, from the uh, 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 Academy. Uh, and uh, we were not immune, and we had our own problems. And uh, although uh, uh, the library continued to receive people, people started closing the library, not destroying it, but closing, banning people coming in, etc. And we faced a wave of unrest and confrontation. And uh, this is, uh, it started on the 26th of October. Here I'm being surrounded by... Uh, uh, by people, mostly employees, and a few people from outside, but mostly employees. 
and who uh, had demands then they this is the they entered the fifth floor the executive floor and locked me up in my office for a while until I left through the window to avoid uh, any military confrontation but with rational discourse and so on we got everything back to normal and everything is functioning well in the library uh, from uh, the early January last year 2012 so mid-January things went back. What is very important to me was that not a stone has been thrown at the library, not a person was wounded, no fights, uh, and we handled all the grievances in ways that uh, enabled the library to function and remain true to the values that it stands for. And calm returned, and Prometheus still stands proudly in front of the library. What's happening in Egypt now? Where do we go to the future? And that's my last part. After an 18 months transition, we had our first elected president. And whether for or against him, I would say simply to everybody, he is by far the most educated president we've ever had. He is, after all, a professor and a PhD from the United States, and a very distinguished man. But turbulence continues, and the stakes are very high. Why so? For various historical reasons, I think it's important to develop a different understanding between the Muslim world and the West generally, and the U.S. specifically, for world affairs. And the Arab world has a disproportionate influence within the Muslim world. Uh, I mean, the 340 million Arabs have a disproportionate influence on the 1.4 billion Muslims around the world, partly for history reasons, for many other reasons. And within the, the Arab world, Egypt has disproportionate influence. I mean, a, a successful democratic transition in Egypt with a liberal version of Islam uh, presented to Egyptians and to the world would have a very profound impact on the rest of the Arab world and on the whole Muslim world. So the success of Egypt's democratic transition is very, very important. And beyond tomorrow, we, of course, don't know. We can speculate. But I'm optimistic. And why am I optimistic? Well, for one thing, I think on a three to five year time horizon, I have five reasons to be optimistic. And they are objective reasons. Leaving aside anything that happens to me personally, I'm talking about an analysis of the situation. For one thing, Egypt is remarkably nonviolent. I mean, you look at the size of these demonstrations, for and against each other, confronting each other. There is, I mean, compare it to Libya, to Syria, to Yemen, to Bahrain, to etc. You know, it's very different. These are the supporters of uh, the president. These are the opponents of the president. They all express their views, and uh, they do it largely in a nonviolent fashion. Uh, these are pillars on which to build a future republic. Now, uh, this is the size of demonstration. This is Qasr Neil Bridge. They're going towards Tahrir Square. Gives you an idea of the, the size of it. And when you have demonstrations of that size in the million people, 900,000, 1.2 million people, uh, and you have, you know, then, oh my God, after so many days of demonstrations, there have been uh, three people dead and uh, 250 wounded. Well, it's terrible. One is too much. But still, it's very nonviolent. Secondly, is an amazing commitment to the rule of law. I mean, they may say, impeach the court. This is the Supreme Constitutional Court. Impeach the court. Uh, you know, we need to change it, etc., etc. But what the court says is obeyed, including when they dismissed the, the previous parliament. And uh, it's almost like the United States. I mean, just think anywhere else. I mean, people say, I am going to show this president, I'm going to file a lawsuit in the Idariyal Olya. I'm going to file a lawsuit at the Constitutional Court. Uh, can you imagine somebody filing a lawsuit against Bashar al-Assad in Syria? Can you I mean, this idea of, one of the biggest issues with the president, what did he do the, the, the constitutional referendum legally? Did he have the right to change the uh, prosecutor general? I mean, it's all legal points. And that's wonderful that there is this kind of attachment with the idea of the rule of law. The elections. We settle our differences with ballots and not bullets. We've had seven elections not counting the last referendum. All of them were beautiful. 
Here is an example, all these women of all political orientations queuing up to vote, voting, young westernized, older women, very traditional. Everybody, whether young or old or proud to have voted, the orderly process, look at the queues, nobody's pushing anybody. And the actual counts of the ballots were transparent and fair. So this is a very major thing on which to put our faith for the future. The fourth is an unusual choice for me, and that is that it is deeply divided. Now, most people think that we have a problem with that. I don't think it's a problem. I think the real problem would have been if either Mr. Shafiq or Mr. Morsi had won with 75% of the vote, because then the tendency to just crush the remaining 25% would have been overwhelming. But the fact that it was almost 50-50 means that the points of view are getting expressed and that there is knocking out against each other. So this narrow victory is important. And a deeply divided country is not something against democracy. I mean, remember Dewey defeats Truman, a uh, famous uh, story about how close that election was and how everybody got it wrong that uh, Truman was going to lose, but he won. Or we all remember 2000. For weeks on end, the hanging chads, right? And, uh, but democracy continues. And a deeply divided country can be rallied by the president if he will actually embrace some of the opposition. Each side still dreams of completely knocking out the other, but it's not going to happen. And when it doesn't happen, then what will people have to do is to compromise give and take and reach a compromise, and that's the beginning of pluralistic politics, which is what you need in a democracy. So we have to reach that momentum, and this deep divide, actually, I want to say, preceded the revolution. It is found throughout the Muslim world. That's an important qualifier, because people imagine that it's because of this. Uh, Muslim societies have all sorts of major contradictions. I'll just give you a picture is worth a thousand words. How about this? One couple, second couple, together on the same boat in Alexandria Harbor. These divisions exist in society. Now they're manifesting themselves about what sort of a society do we want to build in this new republic. Well, they have different views, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's wonderful. The question is we have to find a way. These were demonstrations pro-hijab under the Mubarak against the former minister of culture. Banning of books. Banning of books exists in every society. And the examples I will give are pre-revolution, just to make sure that we're, I'm making the point. So freedom of expression must be protected and the battles have to be fought. In 1926, Tahsin wrote a book, which was very famous, and he was taken to trial for apostasy. The case was dismissed. Seventy years later, in 1996, Nasr Hamad Abu Zaid was declared guilty. And uh, of course, the government didn't impose uh, sanctions, but the public did. And he and his wife were so harassed that they moved to the Netherlands. We invited him to speak at the Library of Alexandria. He passed away last year. But my young friends, uh, the Wikimedia people, the Wikipedia Arabic people, just said, we have a simpler statement, all these discussions about freedom of expression. Censorship sucks. <laughs> they sent me that. So we must deal with these things and accept uh, now, the first reason for optimism is the miracle of the Egyptian revolution has been suddenly everybody is involved. If you had asked me two years ago, I would have told you apathy is the biggest problem. But now, people who would never go on demonstrations are going on demonstrations. People are participating and voting, and they're discussing and debating everywhere. The bloggers and their readers, these are uh, more uh, upwardly scaled bloggers, these are uh, uh, poorer bloggers, but they're all there. And this really captures the spirit of self. <laughs> <laughs> the president's statements and decisions are subjected to intense scrutiny and debate, whether for or against, and a very heterogeneous political landscape has been created in Egypt. These are all the political parties. Now, in fact, of course, in the first assembly, we saw that that huge scenery translates into bigger blocks. 
And uh, but today the Al-Nur party has been split in three. This is still the Muslim Brotherhood. These are all the other ones. That's from religious to secular, from left to right, uh, different groups. There was a rush to complete the draft constitution, and uh, the leaders of the opposition Salvation Front are now trying to get some compromises and made. Uh, those are with the president. Those are against the president. Uh, they're all taking to the streets, but all in a peaceful fashion and expressing themselves. Women's groups are very active right now, and they demonstrate because they don't like some of the articles in the new constitution. This is a creative youngster who did a YouTube underwater demonstration, which appeals to me, Maria. <laughs> it says, no to the constitution. Even the fish reject the new proposals. <laughs> so we prepare for the next elections, and that's the basis for optimism for our second republic in three to five years. Why do I keep saying three to five years? Because zero to three years, we have short-term turbulence. Stability and institutional development, you know, goes like that, and then you'll have a little bit of fear before it starts stabilizing. Now we are right in this part here, and we shouldn't be too concerned about that. They're going to be bumpy. Why? Well, because confrontations till the compromise really starts taking hold, the economic crisis, and the development of a culture of pluralism. That's important, to accept difference of opinions and not try to reject the other. And today, whether the, 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 the populism is based on religious or on totally atheistic, as we saw in the case of the Cultural Revolution in China, it is counterproductive to move in that direction. We need orderly participation in debates. That's what we do at the library, complex issues, to careful study, mobilizing intellectuals. And I believe in the power of ideas. I believe in the power of ideas. I have an expert witness, which I shall call. You all know him? <laughs> he actually said that. Do you know what astonished me most in the world? The inability of force to create anything. In the long run, the sword is always beaten by the mind. And this is a guy who should know. Because he left us, on the one hand, the civil code, the Code Napoleon, which lasts everywhere. And, of course, his conquests and his losses were very ephemeral. And so, I say from another great writer, Abel Camus, don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Just walk beside me and be my friend. And we continue to make our contribution in this, defending human rights and freedom of expression. And we dare to dream and to invent the future for building the new Egypt. Defending these basic values against obscurantism, fanaticism, and xenophobia. And I'm happy to say I'm working with Sheikh Al-Azhar to really come to grips with that issue. And here I am, here, and I'm talking to Gupin Al-Azhar, producing the Wasiqat Al-Azhar, the, the Al-Azhar Declaration. We are reissuing the classics of the humanist thought in Islam in the last 200 years. And there's so much more to do. And so, my friends, I say, yes, the future looks very good, very optimistic. And I'm proud to be with an institution that is an artisan of this better future. And that moment says it all. And that's why I say that we stand proud as we build the future. For it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul, said Henley. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs> well, thank you. This was in, an incredible, incredible way to start our day. Um, and it sets us on the right course, thinking uh, about the right issues. So I know you have five minutes. I'm, I'll, I'll give you whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you'll indulge us, I'll uh, open the floor a little bit for a few questions, both from here and from the field. So please come up to the microphone, say your name. Uh, what you do, very briefly, and ask your question. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, my name is Alicia Hetzner, and I'm an editor. Um, Ismail, 
I always had the word was visionary. He was always 10 years ahead of his time. And I just want to mention for a bank that the, the waves, some of the waves he created are still rolling. First of all, when we had the first conference on culture and development in Africa in 1992, he had African, young African women in the bank who were unit leaders, unit chiefs, be the moderators of every session. One of them was Ngozi who of course eventually became a, non, a, um, a managing director. In other words, he picked young women who were promising when the bank was not into young women who were promising, and he picked African women. Ten years later, the bank finally figured about, out about educating girls. Second, he broke social development out. He created social development out of environment department. We had no social development. It was just infrastructure, agriculture, and and. Um, um, environment. And so, so it's, you know, now we have fragile states. We, he started that. Um, and then the Hunger Conference was in 1993. The ESSD, after he became VP for ESD, he brought Rutra Scali and Jimmy Carter, and then he started doing these dialogues, consistent dialogues with NGOs, which the bank was not doing. I think the last one for me, um, he brought Robert Putnam from Harvard here to talk about social capital in 1992 at the Africa Conference on, on Culture and Development, and, and the work Social capital was not in general parlance, and ten years later, it's on the Diane Reem show. I mean, it's part of social. It's part of the um, the um, parlance. It's normal. So he is a visionary. And then there's other thing about genetics and a GMO, and then chairman of the World Water Conference because he said water will be the issue of the 21st century. Things like that. Thank you. I assume this was not a question, but it was a good point. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and. Um, Mr. Uh, Ismail Saragoldin, uh, thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, my name is Iftikhar Mustafa from CGIR, and as a former chair of CGIR, it's really my pleasure. I've, I didn't have the pleasure to work with you, but obviously I've heard a lot. Uh, I have a question, and, and uh, it's to do with the, um, your, your, you, have, you have shown the importance of knowledge and how knowledge, you have captured the knowledge and so on. Um, from the perspective of, I'm slightly looking from the perspective of CGIR a little bit, given that we have a billion people going home hungry, uh, given, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the issue of food security, environmental issues, and so on, I, I want to get a sense from you that how you take uh, a knowledge and use that knowledge in an application sense in the fastest way because you know you can capture the knowledge you can do a lot of research and obviously you're shown that one of the oldest complaints was on, on in the research thing but when people are hungry out there people are wanting all those things to be done now in your view how do you make that happen very quickly to take the knowledge and make it applicable and in application in, a, in the fastest time thank you Let's take another couple of questions. Yes, sir. Fascinating presentation, Dr. Ismail as usual. Uh, I'm Yasser Gamal, Sector Manager for uh, Social uh, Protection and Labor in the MENA region. You talked about how important the transition in Egypt is, and I, I don't think anybody can contest that, but everything in the region is interconnected, and I, there's a lot of geopolitical changes that are taking place. So. I'm interested to hear what your views about where things were settled in terms of, you know, the Turkish role, in terms of the emerging Qatari role, and I think some words on that would be extremely useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations. It's very impressive. Um, there are so many things which I foresee as possible for what we are doing. Do you think your project is ready to have a package uh, for educational purposes to disseminate it across the world in libraries and museums? Um, but I, based on some work I've been doing with UNESCO and European Union, uh, and Nordic countries, I think it qualifies. I mean, it's quite impressive. Uh, so to prepare a sort of curriculum package based on what you are doing and to disseminate it all over the world. I have a conf I will have a conference again in May in Florence, so I would, it's very concrete uh, what I'm asking. 
because we have been doing so much and it's so relevant from Scandinavia to South Africa, from London to Japan, and going through China, is extremely relevant to what you have been doing. And it's not for the sake of promoting Egypt or your library, it's for the sake of the basic needs in education and development across the world. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me just say that for the how to reach quickly the billion people who are still hungry, that was the topic of my uh, entire course at the uh, Collège de France, it was mobilization of knowledge for the abolition of hunger. And uh, what you, I think you need to do is to work on, on parallel streams, streams that deal with how are you going to feed 9 billion people, uh, trying to catch up with the caloric coverage for the billion that is now our shortfall, plus uh, uh, another two plus billion people on the planet, largely on the same amount of land and the same amount of water. And that uh, science has got to continue nonstop. And the second part is how to quickly get the result of the science into uh, the farmers' fields. Uh, my late friend Norman Borlaug, Nobel laureate for the Green Revolution, his uh, last words on his deathbed, somebody came to him and told him about the results of the trials that they were doing, and he said, get it quickly to the farmers. And he was right. Uh, Norm was, uh, was an inspiration for us all. So the second thing is that the bureaucracies in governments, plus the enormous excessive regulatory uh, concerns that have now been put in place that make it extremely difficult to deal with a lot of these issues, need to be revisited, and we need to involve a lot more the civil society, the farmers associations, the women's groups, etc., etc., into the adoption and and uh, and uh, adaption of, of uh, these new sciences. Uh, the the third part, of course, is that governments have to confront their uh, policies, uh, including um, uh, the massive uh, subsidies to uh, European and American farmers, the use of uh, of uh, um, biofuels using corn for ethanol biofuel production, which increases the price of corn and led to tortilla riots and is not really going to help uh, uh, replace uh, fuel that uh, much as people think. So we have these three uh, links, government policies, the research program, and getting uh, material quickly to the field, and that will require uh, not only government revision of their policies, but will also require uh, involvement of the local communities and all the actors, and rely much greater reliance on the civil society to be the intermediaries in, in that program. And that needs uh, uh, some doing because governments are still very turf conscious. But uh, it's important because, I, I, like uh, Mohini said, I believe that uh, it doesn't matter who does it as long as it gets done. Uh, I'm even willing to say I don't care who gets the credit as long as it gets done. <laughs> I mean, that's the, the main the main thing we want is 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 that uh, that it, it gets done. Uh, on the uh, what would happen? And yes, sir, uh, asked about the the emerging roles of different powers and so on. Uh, I think it's very true, and all of these uh, issues interplay. But I focused on a particular point: the success or lack thereof of the Egyptian democratization experiment. If, as I hope and as I think, Egypt will succeed, it will start having an enormous influence on the rest of the Arab world and uh, uh, on the rest of the Muslim world. And uh, yes, Qatar uh, and Jordan, uh, Morocco can do great things. But in the end, um, you know, if you think of Europe, Switzerland, and uh, uh, Luxembourg, no matter how good they are, uh, cannot have the same influence on Europe that a Germany or a France can. And simply, simply that's just a fact. And, uh, and uh, uh, when Egypt will get its act together, its impact on the region will be very large, not because of Egyptian troops or, or Egyptian anything, it's just that the reality will be such. And we saw that, for example, look at East Asia. For a very long time, we talked about Korea, and Taiwan, and Singapore, and Hong Kong, and so on. But when China finally started moving, uh, you know, it dwarfs everything else. 
And Egypt is now over 90 million people and growing. I mean, growing. I mean, it's a very narrow piece of land that we're living in, but but it's enormously dense and all. But but if it gets its act together, if as I hope in three to five years, uh, uh, there will follow that inevitably realignments that will uh, uh, take place, influence will be realigned in certain ways. Uh, Turkey and uh, Iran are, are important players, and so is Saudi Arabia, but they have different perspectives, and both Turkey and Iran do not speak Arabic. That has a limitation on how far their appeal can carry. Uh, now, uh, I am not blind to the obstacles. I just happen to naturally be an optimist and naturally believe that we can do things that most people can't, don't believe can be done. But, uh, but uh, I mean, who would have believed that uh, Hosni Mubarak's regime would collapse in 18 days of a peaceful demonstrations? I mean, it just, you know, it seemed impossible at the time, or, or Ben Ali, or whatever. So the situation is that things can take place. But, but, yes, there is another scenario. There's a very negative scenario of what's going on. Uh, one sees a scenario of balkanization and... Uh, and uh, we saw, or, or, or divisions, we saw the division of, uh, of uh, Sudan. Uh, you look at uh, Syria, there's a lot of ethnic groups and uh, enclaves and so on, reminiscent of what we saw in the, in the Lebanese civil war. Uh, the potential is there. Iraq is already uh, split more or less into three parts, and so on. And you you have uh, so one can imagine a situation of continued conflict and and more or less low intensity conflict where everybody is trying to cope with their own affairs, and where nothing happens. But I think that we have the makings, and objectively, these five uh, objectives, uh, objective analyses that I made, five pillars, give us the the, the reason to hope that in fact the. The, the Egyptian experience, which is what I focused on, can take place. And if it does, then it will have repercussions, I think, more than others. As to uh, uh, the project on libraries for the conference in Florence, that's uh, another story. Uh, I am very involved with libraries. I mean, I, I, I just mentioned I'm on the visiting committee of the MIT uh, library system, and I just came from there, and a statistic that stayed with me was 91% of their new purchases are all digital and uh, their, their new acquisitions are, are all digital. So it's, uh, uh, we are witnessing a profound transformation with the MOOCs, the massive online open courses. When you start having 100,000 people in a course rather than uh, 50 or 100, uh, the teaching and the relationship changes. Even though the latest figures show that about 6,000 finished a 100,000 course, that's still 6,000 students. I mean, you know, compared to 60. <laughs> that's a 100 times more suddenly in terms of reach of professors at Harvard and MIT and so on through the edX or the Coursera or the or the Udacity of Stanford and uh, not to mention the Liberty University and the Khan Academy so we're witnessing a lot of transformations going on what's going to happen to the libraries and how are they going to function with that changing atmosphere so a lot of it was being anticipated more or less in, in what we tried to do at the Library of Alexandria and I guess a number of them are interested in what we do uh, or interested enough to talk to us about it, but uh, that's uh, where it will have to be. But uh, one thing I tell them, I was just speaking to them in Singapore recently, and I said, look, whatever plan you adopt, be ready to change it very quickly, because the world is changing so rapidly. You cannot today design a plan. Uh, who, who would have predicted the importance of tweets, the importance of Facebook 10 years ago? So if you do a strategic plan today, humility please, let's remain very flexible and choose our strategies on a no regret basis. I'm just going to check in. I know we've promised, we've hijacked your time. I know we've promised you your next appointment, but I wanted to see, Roby, we have other colleagues in the room with us who've been listening in from country offices. And Roby, I know you're mining. Do, whether we have any thoughts or questions, yeah? Sarawak? Thank you so much. And we'll take me. one more after Sarwat, and then we're going to wrap it up. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mohini. Uh, Ismail, welcome back to the World Bank. Uh, you've come back after 12 years, and you haven't lost any of your lucidity or uh, <laughs> none of your ability to deliver a multimedia, a true multimedia experience. So thank you very much for that. Very inspiring uh, 
for those of you who are in the room, uh, I, I used to be the guy uh, traveling with a smile with 2,000 slides in my suitcase. So, uh, <laughs> he, he has those were the time. days when we had the 35 millimeter slides <laughs> yes, and, and put them in carousels. Like <laughs> I think you must have used 1,300 today, but uh, no, thank you very much for that. One point, I mean, just to talk about the optimism that you were saying in, into the three to five year time frame. One of the major issues that came up at the, uh, that the World Development Report on Conflict and Development brought up was that the idea of getting the military out of politics is a generational issue. In well-functioning societies with the strongest civil society presence and functioning institutions, it takes anywhere between 27 to 30 years. And they catalog that, uh, that experience. And the question then is, what for Egypt? If, uh, and, and that, uh, the caveat on that was very, very clear. It said if you have properly functioning institutions and a strong civil society, it takes a generation to get the military out of politics. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We'll take one from Roby from the field. Let's see if I can grab this. Okay. This is uh, from Badr in, uh, in Cairo. Thank you for the super presentation. It deeply touched my heart as much as enriched my knowledge. While we must continue to move forward on all fronts of development, priorities of people are reaching, <coughs> sorry, um, are reaching the minimal requirements of life, and that is food for stomach vis-a-vis -vis food for thought. In your opinion, what should we do during this turbulent two to three year period? Should we hibernate until the curve starts moving up? Thank you. Well, that's the, uh, the, uh, Easiest one, I'll take it first because uh, get back to Sarawak in a moment uh, because it's more difficult than the military one. But uh, uh, the answer is an old uh, adage, and I had uh, a very uh, nice poster made that says, uh, Everything cometh to he who waiteth, provided he who waiteth worketh like hell while he waiteth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that proviso is very important. No, I mean, I don't think we should hibernate at all. I think we should be out there. We should be trying to offer solutions. We should be trying to advance. We should be trying to mobilize the enormous latent power of the Egyptian people. We saw it when it came out of nowhere. Uh, uh, the revolution, you saw the pictures of the revolution. I can't communicate enough of that. We are going to go through a very bumpy ride. I, I simply stated uh, because of the economic crisis, but everybody here in the bank knows all about how economic adjustment programs uh, uh, have enormous social consequences and that uh, thoughtful program we talked about uh, uh, Antoine Simon Petri and I and uh, Michel Noel and many other people did that in the 1980s when we introduced the social dimensions of adjustment at the World Bank. Uh, uh, it's going to be difficult, but you have to design the programs and the cuts in ways that protect people's livelihoods. And uh, it's not easy, but it, uh, it needs to be done. And uh, I think, yes, it's going to be bumpy, and we, uh, by greater participation, will not only make it more bumpy, but we will also try to force people to move towards that state where we recognize each other. And I say to a lot of the young people I work with in the library, I'm very proud of the young people I work with in the library. They are uh, average age is about 30, and the managers are in early 40s, and old people like me over 55, we have only 2% of the 2,400 staff, so it's over here. And I can tell them, look, uh, uh, you know, you want democracy? Democracy is about pluralism. Pluralism means divergence of views. So he wants to vote for the Salafis, he wants to vote for the Muslim Brotherhood, he wants to vote for the Marxist left, he wants to vote for the nationalists and the Nasserites, he wants to vote for the Social Democrats, he wants to vote for right-wing capitalism. It's fine. We are all Egyptian citizens, and we're entitled to our point of view, and we are entitled to express that point of view, and we are entitled to try to convince others of the merit of our point of view without beating them up. And, and in the end, we arbitrate by ballots, not by bullets. And that's, that's the fundamental part of, of a, a, a moving to a democracy. And as I said, the culture of pluralism has not been there. And that's why I was very conscious in choosing examples that preceded the revolution. The examples I showed you from Ta Hussein to Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid, who's, uh, these are all from, from, from 1926 to 19. 
96, 70 years apart, uh, uh, show that these types of issues exist, have existed, will continue to exist. Uh, and in authoritarian uh, situations, people just try to get the support of the central authority. But in a democratic system, you debate ideas. I mean, for heaven's sake, in the United States, they're still debating Darwin. <laughs> and whether it should be taught in schools or not, whether it should be taught in schools or not. The, 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 so there's a lot of that. We need to get that in. And that's really, and, and we have, all of us have to do our part in doing that. Participating, debating, convincing others, but at the same time building that mutual respect for difference of views rather than outright confrontation. And he's right. The big issue in the zero to three years is going to be how to go, we're going to go through this this uh, uh, economic crisis, meeting the immediate demands of the poorest members of society and addressing their needs. Now, somewhat you talk about something much more difficult, because there is uh, 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 the obvious and the and the the uh, uh, indirect. Uh, the president. Actually, won a lot of kudos, President Morsi, when he asserted civilian dominance over the military by changing the senior <coughs> commanders. And I think that was a, a, a major step he took and that everybody uh, supported. The other part, of course, is that the military remains a very powerful institution and an institution uh, that has... Uh, uh, discipline and has uh, its own uh, structures and its own uh, domains and the extent to which that will continue and former military people continue to have positions in, in, in uh, civilian institutions, that is another story, but I don't think we want to deprive ourselves of the latent capabilities of people simply because they had a military background I mean, uh, you know, uh, for heaven's sake, uh, think of the uh, Gaulle and Eisenhower, just to, to name uh, uh, two people that uh, uh, had civilian leadership positions afterwards, uh, after having been in the military. So it's not uh, an outright ban, but it's a, it's a much more difficult task. The official one, of whether the civilians control, he did it, he named the head of the army, and that's it. But the extent, the indirect influence of the military-industrial complex, as they said in the United States, that's another story. I'm good at bringing this wonderful conversation, this very rich conversation this morning to an end. And on behalf of Manuela and us, to say an enormous thank you to a number of people who make this happen, Omer and Roby. Thank you. Thank you to our colleagues who listen in from Egypt and other countries because experience is never as real as being in the room. So thank you for that. Kara, our young colleague who, when she looked at your CV and thought of what to put on the announcement, picked your values and your humanity. Um, so clearly that resonated. And Josebe, who runs our language and culture program, who, who really, we're, we're all of this, the genesis. And Alicia, who was in the room and the genesis of this started. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Mena, and um, the leadership program. But mostly, the Ishmael, thank you for always coming and enriching the conversation and debate and for your time and thank your you optimism know. and your humanity. We miss you around these parts, you know? <laughs> what can I say? <laughs>